first of all let me you know also dedicate this lecture to sachidanandan who is you know is my guru is my, my mentor and you know has always been a source of inspiration to me and last week happens to be his 75th birthday and i think i i owe everything to him actually so uh, i dedicate this to sachidanandan and start my presentation basically what i am trying to uh, present it will be a kind of rambling kind of thing basically looking back at uh, film writing of my own in a way like it's all these remarks that i make the kind of comments and critical uh, remarks i make are also about myself about my writing and the kind of limitations that one finds finds oneself in uh, as you go on you know, from the 70s to the post the millennial uh, decades uh, you you find certain kinds of you know questions Uh, that you are obsessed with that you pursue certain kinds of limitations which you find you know some kinds of blindnesses that you have some kinds of you know things which you never notice and which continue to haunt you a lot of uh, things like that and also kind of ideological baggages that you have carried and you know when you look back you feel a little you know when you read you know uh, your earlier essays you see that you know it is a little bit harsh or a lot of blindness in them so it's a kind of looking back at my own writing career and also uh, i think it is shared by in a way it is also about my generation of film critics uh, i'll just you know uh, go back to myself and then go to the topic basically i grew up you know it's a kind of growing up in the 70s uh, basically you know you know inspired by or by the the modernist writing that is happening around like uh kasaki nidigas ovi vision mogandan sakari all these you know new generation of medal radha vision very exciting things happening in literature which is actually a kind of uh, atmosphere where we are actually within living within a kind of literary atmosphere of you know a kind of frozen no view kind of thing and you know also you can't you know the 70s in a way 70s and 90s are in a way mark watersheds in you know the intellectual life of kerala and you know ev- everywhere actually in the sense that emergency was a kind of uh, you know the dark days of emergency was a first one's first interface you know uh, with the 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 dark side of the state and again was also you know a lot of other things like keywords would be like the radical nexlate movement the, the the kind of uh, film society movement a lot of little magazines coming up a lot of things happening in theater in painting in literature writing a lot of publications a lot of new platforms being created a lot of energy uh, among the youth and in the campuses and again like you know uh, i was very much as i said you know uh, literature was one of the major uh, concerns later like uh, a lot of things happening in literature and also which uh, as also a lot of it used to do a lot of translation of poetry which i still continue to do though it is from malayalam to english earlier it was from other languages from english to malayalam uh, for sachidanandan and all that then actually our film uh, viewing actually grew up from not usual you know from childhood uh, because my father was a relative of the theater owner the local irinjala uh, kuda i used to have a free ticket to the theater so you watch all the movies you go every day and watch movie again and again and most of the time you know you just go to the movies and you watch all kinds of movies so actually this shift came by the 70s when film societies came up and you know you watch you begin to watch a different kind of movies which were initiation into the so called classics and you know totally different kind of uh, visual experience along with a lot of writing happening around uh those films like uh basically through you know magazines like film magazine drishyakala and also a lot of very serious kind of stuff produced by film societies themselves all these brochures very serious stuff actually produced by a lot of film series who had their own journals so uh these were the kinds of you know uh, uh, exposures we had a lot of films that we were watching through film societies every month so a lot of discussions and you know uh, about the films the great expectation to watch the films uh, unlike these times when you have everything on in torrent or in your uh, hard disk so you you wait for the film you watch it so intensely so you want to remember it and also you know that you're not going to watch it again you may you may not 
get a chance to watch it again. So the quality of viewing, the quality of attention that one brought into the viewing was much, much greater, I would say. As for writing, I think I began writing very, very uh, late. Actually, I began my writing like many of many, many, many of my colleagues uh, and fellow writers started writing in you know film society you know journals and brochures and all that. Then basically in English, and I ran a kind of you know a column called Rumble Strip in Indian Express for almost ten years during the early nineties. Then you know, uh, then gradually shifted to Malayalam. I've been writing for in Malayalam for the last maybe two decades. And again, you know, uh, what were the kind of books or you know the kind of material that was available to us with regard to film? Actually, it was very very limited. Actually, we very very you know we may have had uh, journals like the Shegala and all that, which had which produced a lot of serious stuff actually and translated a lot of materials actually. Uh, many writings of you know uh, Bazan, Pudokin, etc. already coming there, Eisenstein especially. Uh, scripts were being translated, like Out of the Furnaces, all those you know very uh, uh, many film scripts were translated. Then also like film magazines like Film Magazine, which was produced by Kaumudi, a lot of other kinds of journals which were actually dedicated some part of their you know uh, literary uh, film journalism to serious cinema and a lot of see just people like Kaleka, Ramajandran, all of them were writing at that time. And also like, you know, you had writers like uh, Vijay Krishnan and Shanmukhadas writing uh, very interesting articles on the films you're watching. Again, you know, the, 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 the kind of writing that uh, was coming out, especially uh, in these magazines, like I would say in the post seventies, especially after the generation of writers like uh, Corey Corden or Cynic and you know TMP the Ringardi and all that. These kinds of writings were basically uh, about uh, art cinema or parallel cinema, which was also happening at the same moment. Like in the 70s, a lot of new uh, filmmakers coming up, Adore, Aravindan, KG George, KR Mohan, a whole lot of filmmakers coming out from the institute and creating uh, new kinds of films, which excited you know uh, the, the youngsters of that those times actually. Because there are there are a lot of filmmakers, films. There are a lot of writings happening around them and also new uh, spaces of, you know, platforms for viewing the films. Outside the theaters, even in mainstream theaters, you had this noon show slot. And outside, you had a lot of film societies all over Kerala uh, creating, you know, giving, providing space for these kinds of films, discussing about it, all these films traveling all around Kerala. Though uh, I am not going into that, there were a particular set of films which had their own, you know, they, 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 if you look at the the choice of films, the, the kind of filmmakers, uh, the masters were celebrated, the classics that were, you know, uh, talked about. All these belong to certain kinds of certain patterns and all that. I'm not going into that, but that was our first exposure to serious uh, so-called world or art cinema. And, you know, uh, and writing, early writing, I would, I'll come to that. Well, I, what I'm doing is I'm just uh, from drawing from my experience about reading and writing about Malayalam cinema. I would just would like to you know structure my presentation in four or five six uh, you know segments, and I'll just quickly try to finish it in an hour. Basically, about one thing is what I'm trying to talk about is the location language. Uh, as I said, looking out and writing in. In the sense, being located in Kerala, looking at world cinema, writing in Malayalam, maybe also English. And this, what is location doing? What is it like to, 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 to write in Malayalam about world cinema? And what is a kind of, you know, theoretical atmosphere in which you are actually living, writing in, thinking and all that. That is one aspect, location and language. Second thing is about the kind of shifts that happened from between the 70s and 90s. 70s, a particular period I was trying to describe, and also 90s, post 90s, huge kinds of shifts happening in the whole experience of a cinema, writing about it, accessing, all kinds of things. So that will be one segment which I would like to just uh, mention. Third thing would be the kind of what cultural studies did to film studies. The kind of the cultural studies turn and its political, literary, and theoretical lineages. What did it do to our uh, the, the way in which film was written about, seen, discussed, and all that. And its hangovers and absences. What were the kinds of hangovers that we had? Uh, well, 
through taking us through the cultural studies wave and beyond. Again, what are the kinds of absences there? And certain kinds of unaddressed questions. What are the kinds of lacks, the, the, the voids within it? So hangovers, absences, and unaddressed questions is one uh, thing which I would like, actually would like to focus on. And also about the kinds of contemporary challenges and the directions, uh, which, which I think, uh, if you look at all these, the, 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 the kind of uh, the dilemmas, the conflicts that I face or my generation face, and what are the directions it could, may take. So coming to location language of writing, you know, being situated in Kerala and writing in Malayalam, uh, actually, who am, I, who am I writing for? Who are the kind of addressees or readers of uh, Malayalam film critics of Malayalam a film scholar uh, who is writing in Malayalam? Actually, the vernacular critic, I would call him vernacular critic, uh, lives a kind of dual life. You know? Even while he or she is engaging with a global uh, medium or art form, he has to or she has to primarily address a local reader and viewer as it is written in the vernacular, actually. Obviously, these critical methods, tools, uh, theories, concepts that she uses uh, in writing are predominantly drawn from reading English, uh, material for English text and translations into English. This creates a kind of a kind of islandness, which is not just a question of location alone or being part of the far end of a subcontinent, a place like Kerala, a strip of land. It's not just that, it's not just a question of geography, but also a conceptually theoretical kind of islandness happens. In the process, writing in the vernacular gradually becomes a kind of monologue within a language at the theoretical and conceptual level. As one is always looking up and writing down, seeing the global, consuming global theories, and writing in the vernacular for vernacular readers. It is a one-way flow of concepts, actually, from the global to the national to the local regional, rather than the other way around. Never the other way around, mostly. One major limitation is the inability or lack of platform for talking about local cinema to the global. You can talk back to the global. For it has to speak the language of the global, both its language in terms of using English or French or whatever, and also in its platforms, like its academic seminars or journals or other kinds of global platforms or film festivals or whatever. Not only is the language, is its language, you know, its uh, theoretical jargons or cliches or methodologies uh, and being up to date theoretically and academically, et cetera. It is also a question of referentiality, you know, the, the kind of power of reference. Which is more serious, which is a more very serious issue actually. If you, if a film scholar uh, from the margins, from Malayalam, wants to talk about uh, or engage with global concepts, with the, the kind of uh, the, the kind of concepts and theories which he receives, and want to actually engage with it, critically uh, engage with it locally, he will have to talk in a language which is you know which is understood, which could be understood by the global. Actually, he has to talk. Uh, you have to use references, you have to use uh, examples from global cinema, world cinema, rather than his own cinema, because his cinema is, is incapable of being referenced. The sense, you know, I refer to a, a, an obscure film in Malayalam, which a reader in English or you know somebody else actually can't make out because he, you, he, he, it's not accessible, there's no decent print, uh, there are no subtitles. So how do you refer to a film uh, produced in your own language and talk back to the global, where you know you created your own concepts using your own, you know, film uh, history, film examples, your own, you know, uh, uh, aesthetic concepts and all that, which becomes very difficult. So, it's a, what I'm saying is a kind of one-way process where you always receive concepts and reproduce it, and you know, it's a kind of uh, derivative life in a way. So actually what happens is, it's very difficult to refer to cite local works which are not accessible to the global. It's specific histories, nuances for outside the realm of the sensible for the global. Moreover, they need to be available, as, as I said, in decent quality resolution and subtitles for the other to access it, to refer and evaluate, and thus even begin to engage with the vernacular arguments or insights. For instance, if you are if you engage with the global film theory from the perspective, imagination, conflicts of the vernacular, it almost becomes impossible to share the same references, both of film texts as well as written texts. 
for neither are accessible, accessible or available to the global in the formats and platforms and language that they are comfortable with or, or open to. Which again forces the vernacular critic to refer back to global examples and to explicate local, lo, to explicate local points, local insights and concepts. So because uh, I'll come to that again later actually. This happens, for instance, if you look at film schools, you know, I've often found it very, very difficult to you know, actually explain concepts using uh, you know, local uh, films because they're not available in most, in most of the people have not seen it. So if you look at, if you look at the curriculum, if you look at the, the pedagogy of uh, local film schools and media schools, you can use them always using, you can see them always using the Western examples, the Hollywood examples, the, the European examples, the European films uh, to study, to, 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 you know, teach mise or montage or whatever. So there is a kind of, you know, world we are caught in. So on the one, the internal conflicts and narrative undercurrents of or in the vernacular becomes irrelevant or inexpressible to the global, which again forces the vernacular into a sort of endless monologue. We are only talking about vernacular films in the vernacular language to vernacular audience. This actually uh, severely limits critical theoretical engagement of the film scholars writing in the vernacular that confronts the limits of the local and in and through its language, conceptual paradigms and theoretical tools. So again, this question of who are we actually addressing? Even if you're writing in English, you are forced to talk the others in the other's tongue with, within the jargon sphere of the global to enter the scene. And if you're lucky, engage with it if at all, you're taken seriously. So in the, in the process, actually what is happening is once on contemporaneity, which is irrelevant to the global context, gets unexpressed and in many cases, inexpressible. For instance, if the glaring example would be look at the kind of you know, films that films from India or so-called third world getting into international film festival circuits. It is never about the contemporary of these margins. It is always something exotic something related to colonial connections, something like that. Never the contemporary, because they are not interested in your contemporary. They are always interested in your, the other, othering you, the exotic you. So for instance, this, this is also to, to, to digress, I would say like, this is a kind of uh, relationship that you have with the scholarship in the West or whatever. Like for instance, in a recent interview, I had an opportunity to interview Godard for the IFFK festival and you know, uh, I was actually, all of my questions were actually posed by a, you know, a film cineast located in Kerala, in the third world, in a place like Kerala. So all the questions are like that, never about his films, actually. So again, one question was about, despite making an eight hour long cinema history, there is not a single frame from Indian cinema, which is one of the biggest cinemas in the world, you know, which produces maximum number of films, which also is, has a long history, which also has a huge history of countering Hollywood. Despite, you know, if you look at the histories of other cinemas, they all, you know, had problems with Hollywood or they had to protect their own cinema. Whereas Indian cinema has always tried, but they're not, they're not even exposed to it. They're not even interested in it. They're not even seen it. So that is a kind of equation that we have with the, 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 the so-called global or world cinema and the vernacular. So what happens is a one-way top-down application of theories and concepts from the West to the margins, from English to the vernacular, where we use received theoretical notions, concepts, tools to analyze our films. And also it inhibits and substitutes for local theorization and conceptualization in ambiguity. I'll come to that later. The increasing importance of English and the decreasing importance of writing in the vernacular. That is one major problem, I think, which I think I will have to actually focus again. Second, uh, next part is about lineages, about political, literary, and theoretical lineages. Actually, if you look at the 70s and the shift, the 70s, as I said, the whole you know, atmosphere, the key words would be the, the kind of modernist literature, existentialism, uh, radical movements like an athlete movement, JP movement, and all that, the emergency. Uh, and you know, also we also grew up within the kind of you know, intellectual atmosphere and critical discourse created by people like Sachidanand or especially in films, by people like Chinda Ravindran, OK Joni, A. Soman, et cetera, who are actually writing about uh, films from an ideological point of view. They're, they're creating a huge shift in terms of looking at films, 
analyzing firms, etc. There was also a kind of huge influence of the new left ideas at that time. So again, this kind of dialectic skill thinking was part and parcel of our, the way of looking at the world and thinking. So if you look at the, the generation critics of that period, they, most of them, almost all of them, were part of the film society movement and also very close to filmmakers, actually, newer filmmakers. There is again a kind of link that is that gets broken post 90s. Film critics and you know, filmmakers themselves were very close to each other. And secondly, they were also deeply critical of, they kept away from the industry, they were deeply critical of uh, the, the, the commercial uh, industry. And they also, they, they were actually the writings were tirade against the commercial vulgar sort of cinema. If you look at the kind of shit happened from the 70s to the 90s, if it is, uh, if you look at it in terms of aesthetics, in terms of you know, politics, in terms of the, the kind of uh, economy and all that, you can see it was a kind of shift from the kind of modernist literature we were exposed to in the 70s to the, the, the post-television era that 90s opened up, opening up the skies and television coming in, which radically changed uh, the visual culture and experience of well, you know, all of us. Second was the kind of, if you were, you know, yeah, we, we were actually inspired by uh, radical movements in the 70s. It was actually a post mandal Commission atmosphere that was there in the 90s. So there was a kind of huge shift in the political atmosphere uh, happening. Again, it was also a shift uh, to a kind of communal, uh, communal uh, forces uh, gathering momentum at the, after Babri Masjid demolition. If it was emergency in the 70s, it was Babri Masjid demolition in the 90s. Again, it was state monopoly in the uh, 70s with Indira Gandhi nationalizing everything. And it was you know, privatization and new economic policies of globalization in the 90s. So there's a huge shift at all levels, whether it be culture, aesthetics, politics, or you know, economy. Again, it is the, 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 the kind of 90s you know, changed, uh, as I said, the rise of communal forces, the arrival of television and internet was just beginning. Then again, you know, a lot of materials becoming available. There's a gradual shift from, if you look at compare 70s and the present, especially post 2000, you can see we were actually moving visually. We were moving from a culture of lack and poverty to a culture of excess. There's a huge, we are living in a, in a culture and economy of excess today in terms of you know, or, or visual narratives or information or whatever. Again, if you look at from 70s to 90s, by 90s, actually, film societies are actually waning. They're, the, the way in which it has shown, the way in which film societies organized, the selection of films, the way in which it has shown, everything was actually changing. With the coming of television, there was a huge uh, shift from film societies trainings to, you know, to homes. And which again, you know, went from monthly screenings to festivals. A lot of changes happening in film societies. And also at the academic level, actually, there is a, as I said, this cultural studies wave coming in, and actually, academicization of, you know, uh, film studies became an academic discipline. Uh, film studies becoming part of university departments, especially as an extension of uh, literary language departments. Then a lot of specialized academic journals. Earlier, or most of the journals, if you look at uh, the journals, English journals, if you look at, it was basically defocused by film, Bangalore Film Society or Film India by NFDC and all that, but there's a shift. Uh, you have new academic, specialized academic journals, a new set of uh, readers uh, uh, emerge, peer reviewed kind of journals. So new theoretical models, approaches, languages, and also cliches, jargons, and you know, platforms. Again, if you look at the cultural studies, you know, uh, uh, the wave in film studies, actually, the, the, what was the political promise of cultural studies? Cultural studies actually, you know, shifted the focus from text and author to the context, the social context, the political context. As you know, uh, as Hogarth would say, the texture of lived experience and structure of feeling, as uh, Raymond Williams would say, there is a huge shift from the text-based classics, masters, authors, and all that to the political context, the social context, and uh, from where the text is you know, constructed and all that. So basically, I think some of the key approaches and assumptions of cultural studies was, you know, uh, mass communication, you know, messages are basically systematically distorted, uh, early Stuart Hall kind of you know, approach towards, by unequal distribution of economic and political power, ideology, uh, uh, 
which uh, to which the, uh, it paid a lot of considerable attention uh, ideological criticism how ideology works through texts and all those things became very central to the cultural studies approach and again there is also kind of if you look at the, the cultural studies the development of cultural studies and it's uh, the way it panned out in other parts like there is also a kind of strong interest in in subaltern subgroup you know you know subaltern social groups and subcultures youth cultures and all that teenage culture and all that that happened in many parts of the world so i'm not, i'm skipping that cultural studies part again i would just to summarize the kind of shifts i would say is a shift from text to social political context less focus on formal and stylistic analysis of film text uh more than individual films they were looking at genres and patterns they were not actually interested in the biographies of directors or authors uh they were not actually overly concerned with art films or parallel cinema and all that much more concerned with popular cinema and commercial cinema uh even you know even uh, even if they were interested in they were not interested in tarkovsky or fellini but they were more interested in commercial cinema and also some people some kind of filmmakers like hitchcock and orson welles who had a, who created like a crossover between art and other kinds of uh, cinema so basically it was a kind of interrogation of film text studying films in ideological terms with also a, a kind of you know looking at how the industry functions and how is actually manipulating or you know molding public taste and all that but if you look at the whole you know the 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 contributions of uh, uh, cultural studies in the global context and also how it actually what did we inherit from cultural studies approach and methodologies one thing is like we inherited this ideological approach the ideological underpinning of films huge accent you can see in in the in, in malayalam writings also and they were transiently critical of popular culture bordering on dismissal actually if you look at the writings of uh, ravindran or rok okay, joni all those generation of writers writing about commercial cinema as a kind of opium of the people actually you know, uh, manipulating uh, public taste and all that again they also dismissed this phenomena like stardom fan clubs and all that as vulgar commercial kind of thing and they didn't actually you know didn't bother much about reception or audience but much more were concentrated about they're looking at text analyzing text to see the kind of you know uh, the representations at work so in a way like there are different kinds of fallouts one is this kind of you know cultural studies bringing in uh, a kind of shift to looking at popular cinema like analyzing popular cinema looking at stars looking at uh, different ways in which the, the representations within uh, popular cinema uh, you know or, and all that which also gave a kind of you know if you look at the kind of publishing uh, sphere in malayalam uh, actually it gave a lot of seriousness legitimized in a way commercial cinema and its stars icons and all that uh which gradually infiltrated i would say to the otherwise you know elite uh, intellectual platforms for instance you can see 10 years back one could have imagined uh, a madhubhumi uh, annual two volumes having mamuti and mohanlal as their respective covers you couldn't have imagined it uh, till the 90s actually so there is a kind of huge kind of shift and the role of the critic as a kind of interlocutor as an interrogator of images Uh, and visual narratives who stood between the text and the spectator he actually there was no she then anyway unravel the text for the innocent vulnerable spectator sort of thing again you know uh, as i said the kind of focus on ideological criticism focus on representations uh, had a kind of you know you can see the kind of parallels in uh, uh, my little discussions about globalization and all you also have this tendency to have written about it elsewhere in details why i'm not actually going into it but there is this whole question of that is similar to the attitude of the critic like he 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 stays above and beyond the text like when you talk about globalization as if it is happening outside it's a kind of project not as a process you also are implicated in it's a kind of project a conspiracy happening hatched by some forces from outside not a process that in which we are also implicated are part of in various ways you know 
so again there is this kind of you know uh, uh, the, the whole idea of criticism converting any kind of pressure into guilt you know you just critique the text to re- to make the you realize that you are actually guilty you know you are not politically right you are anti woman you are anti dalit you are anti everything you, know? you are anti so it is basically anti pressure you are you are converting pressure into guilt you are you know substituting the the mind for the body and you know which actually you know you can see many of the writings actually if you look at one study by s n g which is published in the shadal which is all about how uh, this mind uh, art cinema as mind and you know commercial cinema as body works through that narrative works through the writings of a whole generation of film writing in malayalam another thing another forward has been this focus on commercial cinema popular culture actually created as i said there is a kind of symbiotic link between the critic and the filmmaker in the 70s and 80s and all that it actually gets broken actually with if the critics of the early generation clearly differentiated between art and commercial and stood firmly on the side of art and parallel cinema the focus of post post studies or 90s generation was solely on commercial films and you know so what happens is there is a kind of i find if you look at the way in which was i i also work closely with a lot of uh, parallel independent filmmakers in malayalam uh, and i find a kind of you know a kind of loneliness a kind of you know being left uh, out in the whole discourse right? because though everybody even the scholars even the fdnias even academic journals uh, film critics are talking about commercial cinema and whatever little experimentation or you know so called art cinema attempts that are happening in in our language it is it is totally sidelined is never mentioned at all and nobody bothers even if you look at the kind of you know references that even you know the reputed scholars make in international cinema they are always referring to commercial films they are not at all referring to they are not bothered to look at the kind of struggles or the kind of way in which art cinema is trying to make itself make its presence in kerala which is also a kind of you know which i also you know link it to the kind of disconnect between critics and the filmmakers so again uh, uh, the hangovers and absences as i said represent- representationalism is overbearing focus on representation in film text criticism focusing on how different social groups were represented Uh, the power relations between various sets of representations uh, actually including like that of minorities women dalits etc one can see actually you can see its shadows in feminist criticism also which often limited itself to representational issues and you know uh, such uh, uh, you know this always often caught in the kind of perpetrator uh, victim kind of dyad and never discussing desire or sexual pleasure or non heterosexuality etc it couldn't account for actually diverse modes of reception and visual pleasure and every analysis uh, film analysis became a reiteration of the same conclusions using the same theoretical framework of domination exploitation or the early male gaze theory and all this you can see still being used again reiterated again and again this is also the endless application of the same theoretical tools jargons and framework to prove the proven when you get in a kind of trap of presentations when you just go on proving taking each new film as a kind of another instance of what is already received in terms of theory again this kind of you know uh, for instance if you look at the response of filmmakers commercial filmmakers to these kinds of criticism of communal uh, you know figures and icons and all that actually they countered it by balancing if you look at the if you can if you if you can you know if you refer back to the kind of Uh, uh the discussion the negotiation that maniratnam had with uh, balra baltakre shusena about you know which scenes to be kept in bombay you can see this kind of balancing at work you have representations of one community you have equal representation of the other evil and you know good uh, equally balanced so that is a kind of you know uh, the the kind of trap that representation falls into when you look at it from a presentational point of view there are bad muslims there are bad hindus there are good muslims there are good hindus so everything is fine everything is balanced but only representations can be balanced the social inequalities can never be which in a way anesthetizes anesthetizes the life contradictions 
and real contradictions and conflicts of interest in society. <clears throat> Actually, it's also not a question of if cultural studies was about taking sides. This is this becomes a kind of you know a balancing. Uh, uh, technique which actually anesthetizes or neutralizes your, you know, representational uh, tirades against the film. <clears throat> so I think what happens is like you, this focus on representations and focus on this kind of, you know, victim modes and this kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, reiteration of this uh, exploited mode and all of that. Actually, what happens is that. Uh, Every critique, the writing of criticism becomes a kind of unraveling of the class, gender and class biases. It never looked at it from the other side of the perverse and subversive pressures they offer to viewers and the various kinds of uses they make of it. As you know, I would, uh, as Raymond Williams, you know, says in his, uh, in his last uh, book, he says, to be truly radical is to make hope possible, not rather than despair convincing. What we are doing is we are making despair convincing. We are making the whole you know, status quo very, very convincing by proving it again and again through various angles, rather than trying to look at the kind of ruptures, the kind of you know, uh, ways in which there are subversions at work within the, 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 the text. Again, if you look at the kind of way in which text and viewer was you know, viewed, for instance, if you look at the kind of uh, the, the kind of uh, concepts or methodologies that that uh, cultural studies develop, like Stuart Hall looking at it as a kind of a dominant, negotiated, and oppositional readings, you can see that we seldom look at these oppositional readings of film. They're also looking at the dominant, uh, explicating and you know, uh, unraveling and reasserting the kind of the dominant uh, ideologies, how they operate through film text, rather than. Uh, exploring ways in which there are some kind of oppositional uh, readings happening at the level of the audience or through the text, through various ways within the text. Again, which is also related to his, this kind of you know, obsession with closures. If you look at uh, films being judged and his ideological intentions and biases are formed by pointing at, pointing at closures. It is a kind of, there is a kind of, you know, uh, uh, obsession with these linear teleological models, you know, beginning, middle, end, and this kind of post effect teleological kind of thing, which I think we, it draws a lot from our uh, Marxist past and all that, where history takes a particular kind of, you know, uh, direction. And, you know, if you look at films, it never looked at the kind of issues, problems, and dilemmas that were thrown up by the narrative through its unfolding, rather than by its closures. You have a kind of notion where you, know, you, you are actually still uh, you know, fixated to a kind of notion where all the problems thrown up by the narrative are resolved at the end. But rather, if you look at uh, you know, films, the way in which people uh, experience, enjoy, remember films, they're through fragments. They're through certain scenes, certain songs, maybe a certain gesture, a dialogue. That is what remains. That is what persists. That is what lingers. But our analysis never takes into account the, the, the power of the fragments or you know, the way which the, 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 the different kinds of pressures or subversive uh, ideas or uh, desires that the film opens up through its narrative unfolding. Again, Stuart Hall, a uh, very interesting remark by Stu he says, we have to operate our, I'm quoting him, analysis of meaning without the solace of closure more on the basis of semantic reads that Benjamin proposed to find the fragments, to decipher their assembly and see how you can make a surgical cut into them, assembling and reassembling the means and instruments of cultural production, unquote. Again, if you look at uh, different kinds of studies, for example, Murli is here, Murli's study on, you know, uh, cure, or desire working through my life. It's not about the narrative at all. It's about certain kinds of you know things happening through the narrative, within the narrative. Though it may have a kind of heterosexual narrative, larger framework of heterosexual love, it has a lot of homosexual and other kinds of desires working through it in fragments, in certain scenes, in some kinds of subtext or you know uh, parallel narratives that are happening within it. 
So I think we never actually release, uh, you know, what could be an exception in the film, uh, studies uh, we have made actually. For instance, I would also like to, like somebody who draw me atten drew my attention to the film, like Ishq, you know, uh, which, you know, whose whole length consists of extended performance of toxic masculinity. And you have a gesture at the end, how do you account for this? <clears throat> Again, this, it also, you know, extends to the kind of fear of pleasure, as we uh, mentioned, the question of scopophilia, uh, visual pleasure, that one derives from watching the movies were never addressed. Obsessed with meaning and political correctness, scopophilic pleasures was never recognized or addressed. As I already mentioned about this uh, mind, art, serious cinema as the realm of ideas and intellect and emotions, pleasures, et cetera, and body considers low and vulgar and you know belonging to the realm of the commercial. We never asked about questions of who is pleasured, by what means, at whose cost, et cetera, was never addressed. It could also be, as I said, could also be a hangover of a Marxist you know, past. Um, in many cases, the present, within the theoretical discursive horizons in which we tend to think and analyze, is also reflected in our, you know, so kind of penchant for binaries and polemics, or missing out, always missing out what is in between, uh, the flows and flux, the the the, the liminal uh, is always missed. You always have this working with binaries, Mamuti, Mohanla, LDF, UDF, sort of thing. Uh, and I think actually Wendy Brown actually observes very sharply. She says. One crisis of left cultural critique has been this failing into falling, the, is the falling into, into the trap of illusory dialectics, where we posit and so find opposites, contradictions, indifference. There are differences, but we always posit oppositions, opposites and contradicts in it. This is a kind of left, left legacy, she says. With the obsession with ideological underpinnings and significations, the focus of criticism was on meaning and knowledge rather than on effects and experience. Basically, hermeneutical rather than phenomenological, maybe. So I will also, next portion, I would like to address some absences and unaddressed questions. Again, as I said, cinema was not seen as a kind of sensorium, you know, where you have you know, just about uh, a story about meaning, uh, and you know, uh, uh, signification at that level, but also it's a sensorium that requires a viewer to bring, uh, you know, all your senses are involved. We never had uh, any kind of you know, criticism which actually looks at cinema as a kind of sensorium where different kinds of desires and, you know, are at work. Another major lack I would say is that uh, lack of understanding about religion and spirituality. If you look at a whole lot of writings happening on uh, religious imageries, religious themes, branded as, you know, by banding and clubbing together all symbols of, symbols of religion, references to religion, God, belief, rituals, spirituality, et cetera, as communal, we lost sight of certain ways of experience and expressing life and being and becoming, actually. For a culture and people whose everyday lives and ideas about ethical life moral life is deeply steeped in religion. Such misrepresentation uh, made whole ways of being invisible, indecipherable and inaccessible. It made religion and religious imagination and modes of religious and spiritual life into a monolith, you know, disregarding and uh, being becoming insensitive to the umpteen differences, conflicts and diversities within any kind of religion. Not understanding it as a plurality, we also turned ourselves away from the long and vibrant history of subversive and counter traditions within it, which have also found expressions in classical folk, popular art, performative traditions, and you know different kinds of forms. This made it impossible for a critic to be critical to be a critical insider in our tradition, especially in Malayalam. For instance, a cultural theorist like Rastam Barucha points out. He says, without being sensitive to the multiple levels and angles from which, from and in which gods and the divine manifest in India, that prevents 
he says the whole manifestations if you look at closely at performances and manifestations gods and divine in india it actually it resists any kind of representation in a monolithic and over determined way which is unfortunately what seems to be happening in the fundamentalist appropriation of religious imagery it also reminds us that the many areas of ambivalence he says it's a very important thing i think he reminds us that the many areas of ambivalence have not been answered because we have not framed the questions they don't ask the right questions to it that is why it doesn't answer because you have you have all it is you have let it be appropriated by the fundamentalists which is again one could refer to the kind of you know uh, references to uh, bira jeevan writing on narayana guru because you asked him asked the guru the wrong questions because he was uh, he says nammude uh, uh, i am quoting ആധുനിക കേരളത്തിന്റെ പിതാവും സാമൂഹ്യ പരിഷ്കർത്താവും മനുഷ്യ സ്നേഹിയും ഒക്കെയായി നാം പുകഴ്ത്തിക്കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്ന നാരായണ ഗുരു ഒട്ടുമുക്കാലും പാശ്ചാത്യമായ മനുഷ്യ സങ്കല്പത്തിന്റെ മൂല്യമണ്ഡലത്തിലൂടെ നാം കാണുന്ന ഒരു ഗുരുവാണ് ഗുരുവിനെ നാം കേരളത്തിന്റെ ആധുനികതയുടെ പിതാവായി കണ്ടത് ആധുനികതയെക്കുറിച്ചുള്ള നമ്മുടെ കടം കൊണ്ട സങ്കല്പങ്ങളിലൂടെയാണ് എന്നർത്ഥം വാസ്തവത്തിൽ ഗുരു അവതരിപ്പിച്ച ആധുനികതയുടെ അർത്ഥം കാണുക കണ്ടെത്താൻ ആധുനികതയെക്കുറിച്ചുള്ള നമ്മുടെ സങ്കല്പങ്ങൾ തടസ്സമായി തീരുകയായിരുന്നു ഗുരുവിന്റെ സമീപനമല്ല ഗുരുവിനോടുള്ള നമ്മുടെ സമീപനമാണ് തെറ്റിപ്പോയതെന്നും അതിലുള്ള ഗുരു നമ്മെ കണ്ടതുപോലെ നമുക്ക് കാണാൻ കഴിഞ്ഞില്ല എന്നും തെളിയിക്കാൻ അധിക ദൂരം പോകണമെന്നില്ല ഫ്രോം ബി രാജീവ് ആൻഡ് ഓൾസോ ഐ വുഡ് ഓൾസോ ഡ്രോ യുവർ അറ്റൻഷൻ ടു സംബഡി ലൈക് ഡബ്ല്യു ജെ ടി മിച്ചൽ ഹു ആർഗ്യൂസ് അബൌട്ട് ഇൻ ഹിയർ വാട്ട് പിക്ചേഴ്സ് വാട്ട് പിക്ചേഴ്സ് വാണ്ട് ഇസ് എ വെരി ഫാസിനേറ്റിംഗ് ബുക്ക് Uh, ask you have to ask pictures and icons what they want what can we critically and aesthetically empathetically engage with there only can be critically and empathetically engage with not only religious traditions and spiritual symbolisms but also any kind of imagery and iconography that is why he says you have to ask what the icon the image desires what the picture wants not what we want from the picture not just about meanings in the picture but also desires of the picture another point uh, i'm rushing the point is this we we also disregarded the polysemy of text and the heterogeneity of the view as we have you know referred to in many other instances earlier like text are polysemy you always you know through if you look at the, the kind of array of writing we have made during the last so many years you can see this the we are actually trying to you know uh, enclose the text into a particular kind of you know, mold or mold if you look at the whole discussion about nayat that is now going on you can see this effort to actually you know judge the text and put it in a particular kind of framework from which it can't escape so you you are not looking at the different ways in which it can be read what is it opening up through the its unfolding different the way in which the, the the different kinds of elements that one is critiquing about or talking about how does it actually relate to or function dynamically within the narrative structure all these are actually left out so polysemy of text and also the heterogeneity or the viewer is totally ignored i am not going to another uh, thing would be like the question of the, the dalits and the question of caste how caste works in kerala society was never addressed by the uh, film criticism ideological film criticism that is because he thought we were living in a po- progressive post caste kerala society which is all you know the question of caste has been solved once and for all so we didn't ask a question you know about can the subaltern speak or not in quite the umpteen ways in which caste and casteism function in kerala society behind the facade of this progressiveness and leftist supremacy the focus was on critique of explicit references symbols dialogues and narrative actions or situation uh, which you know and you lose sight of the implicit and nuanced ways in which the undercurrents of casteism flow and fertilize our public lives and polity likewise another area which the whole you know imagination sexual imagination is a heterosexual in nature and all of this idea of you know the all the the gender biases you are talking about uh, were actually framed within the heterosexual heterosexual uh, framework it never you know it was strictly heterosexual in, in that sense feminist looking at from the point of view of women and other sexualities non heterosexual desires queer expressions 
were conspicuous by their absence in this whole discourse. <clears throat> now you move to the last uh, part, like the challenges and directions. One is like, uh, if you look at the, the, the kind of work that has happened during the last 30, 40 years, in writing about Malayalam cinema, you can see there's a huge one thing that strikes you first is the kind of lack of archiving and documentation. It never happened, actually. If you look at, you know, uh, people are only recently, I think, some people like Darshna or this new uh, generation of film scholars who are doing some work to archive materials regarding, you know, we are all obsessed with uh, the text, the film text, not about the other kinds of, you know, about film industry, about all kinds of other kinds of discourses and industries uh, that surround any film industry, any, any film culture. So film culture in that sense was totally ignored, whereas we're looking at um, film texts. And this non-availability of such archival documents and background material further limited film studies to texts and orchards with limited focus on aspects of related industry or reception or exhibition uh, market, all kinds of other kinds of uh, you know, uh, 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 domains that are related to film culture industry. Another important point would be the kind of what I would call the kind of the kind of vertical alertness and horizontal indifference in the sense, looking up to the world cinema and the international film festival circuits and the films it promotes, we are always contemporary with the global. Compare it with our contemporaneity with cinemas in other Indian languages. What do you know about Kannada cinema? What do you know about contemporary Telugu cinema or Manipuri or maybe we know a little about Marathi and Hindi cinema, but for other cinemas, we, we, we were not bothered actually. There is, there's a kind of horizontal indifference at work. You, you're not bothered, you don't, just, just don't follow for various reasons, like Godard oh, not following Indian cinema, we are not following those films. And we are mostly ignorant and indifferent to it. While we are up to date with regard to films and filmmakers, trends and styles in the International Film Festival uh, circuits and the kind of films they promote, we do not follow what is happening in other languages in India, except for some exceptions, like maybe some star filmmakers like uh, Rudhuparna Ghosh or Girish Kasravali or somebody like that we may be following. Today, Chaitanya Tamhane or somebody like that. But for that, what is happening else beneath that in, in terms of other kinds of films, we are not actually following at all. If this is the case with films of filmmakers, the case, case with film writing, and scholarship in the vernacular is even more striking. This lack of conversations and engagements across languages in India inhibits incubation of indigenous concepts and theories based on Indian visual cultural practices, local performance and storytelling, storytelling traditions. This lack of give and take and mutual engagement also inhibits our understanding about their evolution, constant engagements of absorption, rejection, and hybridization with the folk, the classical, as well as the global and the Western. You can see the how post 90s, you know, the huge, you know, uh, uh, you know, process of a lot of things are being absorbed, certain things being rejected, a lot of things being hybridized in music, in visual arts, in all kinds of things. So we never actually look at what is happening elsewhere. What is the kind of pan-Indian kind of dialogue that should happen? Never happened. This is the same with, if you look at the kind of writing that is happening in Malayalam, similar kind of indifference you can see towards other domains of knowledge, other disciplines, or in sociology, philosophy, psychology, political theory. But for certain kinds of, you know, given notions or received kinds of certain kinds of theoretical concepts, you are not actually in conversation with film theory, film writing is not in conversation with contemporary sociology. But this is the only anthropological work on Maryland cinema was done by Osella Filippo and you know, Osellas, not by a, uh, by a local film critic, a film scholar. Caroline and Filippo Osella. So it's again, okay, actually, it once again asserts, reasserts the islandness of each vernacular cinema as a discipline and also across languages. Lastly, like, uh, as I said, following uh, Mitchell's this book, what do pictures want? I would like to explore it in the Kerala Indian context. That is what I'm doing now, I'll end with that. She says that the question to ask of pictures is not just what they mean or do, but what they want. 
what claims they make on us and how are we to respond to it. Her argument is also one that connects with certain Indian image and visual traditions and aesthetic and philosophical theories. For instance, I find this in this endeavor, I find uh, two books on narratology, uh, on Indian aesthetics and narratology, very, very exciting, of great help. Actually, he looks at uh, the whole gamut of uh, Western notions of narratives. He takes on Lakhan, he talks about, you know, uh, uh, Bhaktin, he talks about contemporary, you know, narratologists and looks at how, you know, uh, Indian narratives work. The kind of dynamics of Indian narratives at all levels, like classical arts, folk arts, even tribal arts. He takes all these in the account and tries to actually interrogate uh, the received theories and try to connect with the kind of uh, 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 the kind of theoretical or aesthetic philosophical traditions that have never been engaged with for a, for a long, long time. So he says not to blindly follow tradition or to blindly fall in line with what uh, Western theories. Uh, dictate to you, but to create a kind of new conversation with being a critical insider to great conversations with tradition as well as with what is contemporary at the global level. And she also actually, I uh, have uh, she has this, she makes this critical and stimulating engagements, both with Western theoretical traditions and in critically engaging with Indian aesthetic thought, which is classical folk, tribal, oral, written, and performative. That is the kind of you know, uh, domains he works with. Mitchell also questions the idea of critique as iconoclasm. Critique is always you know, the kind of iconoclastic turn to it, like as a labor of demystification, the pedagogical exposure of false images, etc. She says instead to try to sound out the idols, which is he draws from Nietzsche, uh, in Twilight of the Idols, where he says you should sound out the idols with the tuning fork of critical and philosophical language. A mode of criticism that did not dream of getting beyond images, beyond representation, of smashing the false images that bedevil us, or even of producing a definitive separation between true and false images, but to engage in a delicate critical practice that struck images with just enough force to make them resonate, but not so much as to smash them. She talks about paradoxical double consciousness, which we all live in with images that, of, that vacillates between magical beliefs and skeptical doubts, naive animism and hard-headed materialism, mystical and critical attitudes, which also resonates with the idea of, you know, Roland Barthes says about this punctum and studium, you know, punctum, the wound left by an image, and studium, the, the message or semiotic content that it discloses. If, we, if I think we have been far too deeply engrossed in the studium of the images, we studied ignoring its punctum, both in terms of the joys as well as the wounds it leaves behind in the act of perception and contemplation. We have to reckon not just with the meaning of images, but their silences, their reticence, their wideness, their nonsensical, Obduracy. She says we need to account not only for their power, but also powerlessness, impotence, and abjection. Thank you. Stop here.